Welcome to the third episode of Netting Zero, a virtual event series on climate from the New York Times. This episode is presented by Indigo Ag. Did you know agriculture is developing as a leading nature-based climate solution? New greenhouse gas protocols can measure emissions reductions and removals on farms. Indigo Ag is championing farmers and a vision for agriculture that is more beneficial for people and the planet. We would like to acknowledge the farmers transitioning to practices that draw down atmospheric carbon and reduce emissions. BCG, Blue Bottle Coffee, Dogfish Head, Fat Tire, and Shopify are some of the first brands to support verified agricultural carbon credits. Find out how you can support farmers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session of Netting Zero, our virtual event series on climate change from the New York Times. My name is Whitney Richardson, and I'm the Global Events Manager for the New York Times. Thank you all for joining us from around the world today. Our goal with this series is to bring solution-driven ideas to the forefront and to create the conditions for a more informed conversation around climate action. And as we've seen, from our own coverage and our own reports, this conversation could not be more timely. We kicked off this series back in July where a dynamic list of speakers discussed how we can apply the hard earned lessons from COVID-19 to scaling climate action. We gathered again at the start of Climate Week in September to explore what it will actually take to create a new zero carbon normal for cities. This series will continue as we approach COP26 in November 2021, and the New York Times' is Climate Hub, an open multi-use space that we will host in Glasgow. It will be a destination for innovators, students, community members, business leaders, policymakers, and others to discuss and debate scalable climate solutions. Today's conversation between our dynamic speakers will be moderated by our very own Sumini Singupta, the international climate reporter for the New York Times. Before we begin, just a few logistical notes. Audience members, you can submit your questions through the chat function, and we encourage you to do so. You can also follow along on the conversation on social media with the hashtag netting zero. We would also like to thank our sponsor for today's session, India Indigo Ag. And with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Sumini, to begin today's session. Welcome, Sumini. Hi, everybody. Uh, so glad to be here. Welcome to the New York Times Netting Zero virtual series from whatever time zone you're in, from whatever part of the world you're in. Um, we are really glad you're here because we're trying to answer today a really big and really vital question for all of us, which is how do we eat going forward? Why is this even a question? Why is this important? Because we know that what we eat affects the warming of the planet and ultimately our collective survival. The food system accounts for roughly one fourth of total greenhouse gas emissions and it consumes, literally consumes 40% of the world's land mass. And that's not even counting the ocean. We know that climate change rising temperatures, erratic rains, profoundly affects the way we grow our food already. And most importantly, the people who grow them. And now in this year of a global pandemic, we're learning the ways in which our food systems are broken. We've seen how the workers who produce and deliver our food are getting sick. We've seen um, food going to waste, milk being dumped, fields of tomatoes being plowed over, and we've seen hunger, really stark levels of hunger. So how to fix this? That's what we're really here to talk about today. And the big questions that I hope we're gonna get um, 
uh, started on today is, is this. How can the global food system, which is what you and I eat every day, how can the global food system significantly reduce emissions? And more importantly, can that be done in a way that makes people's lives better? Um, so we're going to hear today from a farmer, from several business people, from a climate activist, an academic, and a former United Nations diplomat to help us make sense of both what's being done now and what more needs to be done. So first up, I am delighted to introduce Gonzalo Munoz, who's um, dialing in, zooming in from Santiago, Chile. He is um, the United Nations High Level Climate Action Champion for what we call the Conference of Parties, which is the big UN global meeting where people come together to talk about climate change. So um, I'm delighted to invite Gonzalo to, um, to join us and um, really frame the big challenge for us. Gonzalo, floor is yours. Thanks so much, Somini, and of course, thanks to the New York Times for knitting zero. Uh, in order to reach a net zero and resilient world, it's definitely not enough to only reduce our emissions from chimneys. We know we also need to find ways to restore and regenerate nature. And in that sense, conservation efforts should join forces with food production that must and can move from being part of the problem in many ways to become an extremely relevant part of the solution. We know we need to use the power of renewable energy as well as the power of money and policy, so all business models related to food should be geared to sequester those 10 gigatons of CO2 equivalent we need to uh, sequester per year, to increase the global health of soil, to move all food uh, products less distance and always with uh, zero emissions, also to grow food in cities as well as avoid wa wasting food in the whole value chain. The paradigm that enables this is the paradigm of regeneration, as opposed to extraction. This seems to be a massive cultural shift from farmers to consumers, where veganism and regenerative agriculture are just two expressions of an emergent sense of caring from earth, for Earth and the changes we need to see everywhere. Science has shown the real opportunity this change represents, and it seems like big companies, majors and citizens from all around the world are starting to do their part. How we, farmers, companies, governments, citizens, can all play a part in mobilizing solutions at a pace commensurate to the urgency of this crisis? How can all actors collaborate to ensure mindsets and behavior change for the benefit of the larger food system? That's part of the challenge that I want to listen to our follow, following panelists uh, to be referred to. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I want to invite our first panel uh, to join us. And they're joining from all kinds of places. Ajay Veer Jakar is uh, joining us from India, where he is a citrus farmer based in um, Punjab. Um, and he is chairman of the Bharat Krishak Samaj, which is the Farmers Forum of India. It's a non-political, non-sectarian association of farmers. We have with us uh, also Eric Subeiran, who is the um, One Planet and Water Cycle Vice President at Danone, uh, which means he thinks a lot about um, how a company like his uses water and the planet. Um, and finally, our third panelist, Rebecca Henderson, uh, a professor at the Harvard Business School. And Rebecca's expertise is really um, what, to what degree can the private sector play a role in uh, sustainability? So welcome all of you. I can't see you yet on my screen. Are you there? We're here. Yes, I now I can. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. OK, that's great. Um, so thanks for being here, everyone. Um, I want to just start with a real lightning round to uh, just get us started. So um, just boom, boom. Some of these are going to be true, false questions. Um, and some of these are going to be just, what's the word that comes to your, to your mind? So first one, 
What comes to your mind when you hear the words organic food? Anyone jump in? Expensive. Possible. Right. An opportunity. How much food does the world grow that we don't consume? Is it 4%, 14%, or 24%? Actually, I, I think it's even more than that. I thought it was 30%. I did too. And Ajay, what was your answer? 24%. 24%. The answer is actually 14% of food that is produced uh, in the fields don't actually. That, that is food uh, loss, very different from food we might buy that we don't consume. Food loss alone um, is 14%. Okay, last one, true or false? Most recyclable plastic water bottles are in fact recycled. False. Ajay? I think so, true. I think it's Karen. true, yeah, it is. Sadly, most recyclable plastic water bottles are not currently recycled. Rebecca, I want to start with you. Um, we've heard, especially in recent weeks, so many um, pledges of net zero or carbon neutral coming from a whole variety of companies, including a lot of food companies. So as buyers and eaters of food, what are we to make of this? You know, what, what should we believe? What should we be looking for um, as, as consumers? And what do you think are going to be the biggest challenges for the companies? As consumers, I think we should trust but verify. So I think it's fantastically good news that so many companies are announcing formal commitments to reducing uh, carbon emissions in their supply chain. But it's tempting to make the announcement and then not do very much of anything. Present company accepted, my apologies, Eric. But some companies have been known to, um, to greenwash. So as a consumer, you need to check. Are their commitments being independently audited? Do they have clear metrics of progress? Are they living up to their commitments? As far as the companies go, is it going to be tough for them? It depends how far down the chain they are. In the beginning, it seems to be fairly easy for companies to make real progress against carbon emissions. As you squeeze the lemon tighter and tighter, it gets harder and more expensive. But there's still a ton of opportunities for companies to reduce carbon emissions and make money while doing so. So that's our best guarantee that they're really going to live up to some of these commitments. I want to come back to that point about um, challenges facing the companies, but I wanted to ask you, um, Eric, from your vantage point, your company has um, announced a, a target, uh, a sustainability target. Um, what are going to be your biggest challenges to meet those targets? I think we have many uh, sustainability targets, actually. And I would agree with Rebecca saying that the food system is broken. And that's clear. And as a food company, uh, we acknowledge that. Uh, the linearization of, our, of the food system is the biggest challenge we have to face. We need to move from a linear system to a circular system if we want to achieve our targets. And I think we need to shift agriculture as an issue right now. Agriculture is responsible for 24% of carbon emission in the world. And we need to make sure that we bring back agriculture to a solution. And that's why we believe in, in, in Danone that regenerative agriculture has to be part of the solution, is to bring back this circular system. I also agree with my colleague before that we need to have very clear and tangible uh, objective. Uh, and I think a, a corporation needs to make this objective public. This is why, for instance, we have very clear science-based targets. We are a science-based target company and we commit on reduction of volumes uh, of, of emission in, uh, in our full scope. And we achieve actually our peak of emission in 2019. That means that right now, Danone, every year, 
moving forward will reduce the volume of emission. So these are, these are the type of, of objective we need to have. We need to make them public. We need to uh, regularly report on our progress. Uh, and, and I think the challenge we have is to reinvent. We call it food revolution, not only because we are in France, but uh, we need really to reinvent the food system and, and bring it back to a circular way of, of, of functioning. So that's one of the, the challenge we have in front of us and we are actively working on it. Eric, can I ask you just squarely, is it possible to grow for the company and reduce emissions? Or is, is that a fundamental dilemma that you're going to have to tackle? I, th I think right now it is a dilemma because the system uh, is to be, to be reinvented. Is it possible? Yes, I do believe that you can make sure uh, you develop food, uh, a food system that, that is circular and that is compatible with planetary boundaries. Uh, this is why, for instance, in Danone, we advocate for flexitarism. This is why we are the leader globally of organic and the leader of plant-based. But we continue to, to, have, uh, to be the leader on the dairy product as well, because it's a question of balance and making sure that the way you are sourcing your product, the way you are developing a protein that are good for people and good for planet is, is, is produced in a, in, in a way that is compatible with planetary boundaries. So I, I, I believe there is room for, uh, to feed basically 9 billion people, respecting planetary boundaries and having a, a diet that is healthy, healthy for all. And this is a space, to your point, huh, so many, this is a space where you can create value, when you can innovate, when you, and, and this, this, means, uh, this means growth. Uh, so, so that's that's what uh, what a corporate can do, and 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 we believe that a food company can become a force for good in that in that regard. That's the transitioning in which we are right now. I want to come back to some of the specifics, um, but first turn to Ajay. Ajay, you're a farmer in a part of the world where farmers face some of the most acute impacts of climate change. What are the top three things? that need to happen to address the vulnerability of farmers, particularly um, subsistence farmers? What can farmers fix for themselves? And what are the things that governments should do um, if there's sort of your top, your top three? There is an elephant in the room that nobody is noticing. FAO says that 840 million people in the world are undernutrition, and most of these, ironically, are farmers who are supposed to produce food and feed the world. And this has a link to carbon emissions, and this is directly connected to communities being empowered to feed themselves. Now, every government and every corporate sector is so enamored with the idea of funding and developing efficient food value chains for business models that farmers are started to grow cash crops, shift to monoculture using nitrogen, and most importantly, are increasingly dependent on markets for nutrition requirement, and that's why there is undernutrition, because even though they are supposed to be producing food, they're buying the micronutrient requirement from the markets. Instead and of growing the, it themselves. In, instead of growing it themselves, and that's what's causing the problem. And over 50% of the micronutrients they are buying from the market. And that puts them at risk for price fluctuations and all other issues that they have. And this has a direct link to reducing emissions. Farmers are not going to take any steps to reduce emissions because their priority today is to make their ends meet, to make a living out of their profession. So, that, so the governments will have to fund this. And the carbon abatement costs that are, that are far higher than the international carbon prices that are available. And the carbon credits are not available to farmers in developing countries like India and Africa and in, in, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia. So, so what is happening in, in the US or in Europe is not available to, to farmers in developing countries. There are very many things that can be done that are very cheap, which are not romantic, which do not require large funding, but require different mindset change, which require you to think differently. For example, I'll just give you an example. Animal husbandry is not bad. It's how, how, you, how you rear those animals is bad. It's constantly mentioned, even by 
even by people on this panel that agriculture is contributing, agriculture needs to change. It's not agriculture which is bad. It is big ag which is forcing agriculture down a monoculture line, driving down farm gate prices that farmers are forced to cultivate in a way that they have never done in their lives. And in, in, in their forefathers have never farmed that way. For I'll now give you two specific examples. If you give deworming tablets to cattle, the milk production goes up by 20%. And a deworming tablet, a year-round deworming tablet, costs less than 50 cents. You know, so on one side, we're talking about uh, uh, vegetable uh, burgers, which, which taste like beef. On the other side, we're talking about carbon credits. But you could do much more by just giving deworming tablets costing less than 50 cents a year and, and solve that kind of a problem. Can I ask you, you a, a no, question about, about that? So just about the deworming how does that uh how, how does that help the farmer and how would that affect emissions so a lot of what the cattle is eating is not being digested because there are worms in the stomach so if you have a deworming tablet which is so cheap the the, the animal will actually consume what it is eating and convert it to milk and, and that's what requires less agriculture land. That, that is also a food loss in a way. And that is also for, for methane emission. It, it, it helps. It's a whole picture. You, we've got to differentiate between backyard poultry and commercial poultry. You, you, we, we cannot say uh, poultry industry uh, is, is bad because it's, it's, it's the conversion rate from, from cereals to calories or whatever is high. It's, it's, it's the process that is at fault. It is not agriculture which is at fault. And that's a point that I think we must constantly, as farmers, keep saying that it's not agriculture. It's, it's, it's how we are not being paid a fair price for our produce. If we are given a fair price, we will make a transition to better, mm. to better practices. It's the practice which is, at, which is wrong. Eric, if I could come back to you about um, your biggest challenge. You said we've got to... Um, uh, look at a regenerative way of, of farming. You, of course, source milk from lots of farmers to make your yogurt. Can you say just very briefly, how do you do that to meet the sustainability target? How can the cup of yogurt that I might buy um, have a smaller carbon footprint? Well, I think, first of all, I, I cannot agree more than what Ajay just said. I think it is very important to say that this is the practice. It's not agriculture that is bad. And agriculture can be a solution to climate change. This is my true belief. And actually, I would even go further. If we don't use agriculture, there is no solution for climate change. So we need to bring back agriculture from an intensive farming model to a regenerative model. That's how we call it in Danone. Huh? So we can, we, can, we can go out. So how do we do that concretely? I think I just said something that is very important as well. He said that animal husbandry can be good as long as we use properly the power of grassland that we don't intensify uh, agriculture farming. When you have grassland, Ruminant, for instance, do something that is magic. They transform a non-productive grassland to something that can become good and healthy protein for people. So that's, that's what uh, grassland is all about. Where the system start, start to break is when you convert land to animal feed that could have been used for something else to feed humanity. And that's where you start, for instance, deforesting. That's when you start basically uh, uh, importing and this intensification that can be a problem. So, ha so to your point, Sumini, it's a choice. It's a choice, first of all, to rebalance our diet in a way that is compatible with planetary boundaries. It's a choice to make sure that you use land for what it is best, uh, best at. It's a, it's, a, it's a choice to decide where animal husbandry can become circular and contribute to that. So it, once, once you, you put that in place, concretely, we are working in France, in Romania, in Kenya, with practices that not only increase the resilience of the farm, the resilience of the soil. For instance, we have a project with 50,000 farmers in Kenya where by, by, by having regenerative agriculture, by reducing tillage, by changing crop rotation, by having a circular way, you can increase the time 
uh, uh, that you wait for the next rain to come by six to eight weeks. It makes the whole difference for a farmer. And I'm sure Ajay, where, and I've lived seven years in India, where he is, he knows that having six to seven weeks more to wait for the next rainfall is changing completely the perspective. So this is how you make that. And when you make that, you bring back to the soil carbon matter. Carbon is not bad per se. Carbon is the matrix of life. If you're able to suck carbon into the air, bring it back to the soil through regenerative practices, you are using the force of nature to find a solution against climate change. So this is what regenerative agriculture is all about. So we are in this transition, and I don't want to be too long, but I, I, I mean, I fully agree also with what my colleague that, uh, said before, uh, is we need to, to remunerate farmers differently today. Because what we need to unlock is the fact that farmers is not producing only liters of milk, of kilograms of, 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 of wheat. Yeah, it has also an economic services for the society. And this part of what farming is doing is not remunerated today. So we need to change that. And this is how you're going you're, you're gonna to bring back agriculture from a problem as it is today to agriculture as a solution. Just to be just to be clear, I think what you were saying about uh, carbon is when carbon dioxide is emitted into the atmosphere, it warms up the atmosphere. It's responsible yes. for global warming, but to keep it in the soil is uh, using the soil as a carbon sink, so it doesn't. And go you up can into the bring atmosphere. it back to the soil, absolutely. And, and and to compensate farmers for doing that that service. Um, Rebecca, a question has come in uh, from the audience. Uh, who asks, it's nearly impossible for consumers to determine whether companies live up to their green co commitments, um, whether they reduce waste, whether they actively work towards net zero. So how much can consumers do in this respect? The, the questioner asks, so what can we do to be responsible and informed consumers? But I guess I would take that question one step further. How much can consumers do really? Consumers can do a lot because companies really listen to them. So if we think about the broad brace change we need to see in the food system, it's in general a reduction from the um, consumption of meat protein, particularly beef, towards a more plant-based diet. And consumers can play a huge role in that simply by deciding to eat meat more sparingly. Um, that's true in the developed world, of course, where we're very fortunate to have as much meat as we want. But if you're in the developed world, you can reduce your meat consumption. That makes a huge difference. You can throw away less food. We throw away enormous amounts of food. Many stores throw away the food even before it gets to us because it doesn't look quite perfect. So be willing to buy stuff that doesn't look quite perfect and buy only what you need. And last but not least, don't give up on pressing firms to change their behaviors. It's not that all standards are, yes, it's confusing and complicated, but there's a big difference between a firm like Chobani, which has a long history of living up to its environmental commitments, or a firm like Danone, which is at the very leading edge of exploring these kinds of practices. And just a little digging will tell you that right away, that these guys are really for real. And other firms that are clearly just saying, yeah, yeah, we're doing the right thing. So so where you buy can make a huge difference as well. Are you seeing uh, either in the United States or in Europe or in India government regulations that are affecting business practices? Uh, I'm thinking of the recent news uh, from California to, um, to, uh, to ban plastic, for example. Um, are you seeing those kinds of regulations uh, looming ahead? And what do you think are the most immediate ones? Perhaps, Rebecca, you want to take this first? I'm not sure I do, Samini. I think uh, AJ and Erica are better equipped to answer your question. Eric, what, um, you're, I'm sure you're following this closer than anyone. What, what kind of regulations are you, are you seeing coming down the pike uh, or have affected your company and companies in your sector already? We need, we need regulations. Uh, I think 
companies can only operate when the rules of the games are, are clear. And if we want to make sure that uh, negative or positive externalities are either discouraged or encouraged, we need regulation. So this is this is this is what indeed we are say, we, we we are actually uh, in to, in some areas advocating for. I think for the packaging part, what you said, we we believe in in, in Danone that we need to de- to drive and we're ready to 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 play our part on that uh, to make sure that we have the infrastructure to recycle. I think uh, your point at the beginning is is is, is stunning, you know. Uh, Water bottles could be recycled, but they are not because there is no infrastructure today. So we need to finance that, and and that could be re- regulation. We even advocate in some in some areas of the world to have deposit return scheme that are financed by the private sector. So that's that's something that is needed. Another area where we believe we need, and it's it's closer maybe to our topic today. I think uh, there has been a study one year ago issued during the UNGA that there is one trillion dollars of public subsidies to finance agriculture every year. It's a political choice to make it from financing a status quo or transitioning the model by bringing new source of revenue for the farmers. And that could be that could be a type of, of regulation. Third mm-hmm. example mm-hmm. I can take. I, I want to I want to keep I want to keep moving because we're yeah. almost to the end uh, of our time. Um, one, question, one audience member asks, I think very importantly for you, Eric, you've mentioned regenerative agriculture, but isn't there a limit to how much carbon we can sequester in the soil? There is, there is a theoretical limit, that's, that's correct, but the estimation that the scientists are, are making is that the, car, the carbon thing that today, today 30% of the land in the world is degraded and it's continuing to be degraded. So the capacity of this 30% theoretically could represent somewhere close to 40% of the, the carbon that we need to think back in. So it's not the, it cannot solve everything, okay? But it's a huge part that we can do. And so there so, is a limit, but we're nowhere close to that limit. And, and we are mm-hmm. nowhere close to that. And okay. uh, so, but that's correct. Theoretically, there is a limit. Rebecca, did you want to add something on um, uh, regulations? Just uh, very quickly, um, climate regulation, carbon regulation. Many governments are thinking about imposing a price on carbon emissions. So if you stick greenhouse gases up into the air, you should pay for it because it causes a long-term damage to everyone on the planet. If that kind of price were enacted, then it would could really address many of the problems that that Eric and Ajay are talking about. I mean, for example, if we, and Ajay, you you said this, if we could really give farmers a real price for farming in ways that reduce emissions, it would make a huge difference. And it's not that much money that would really make a big difference. So consumers, if consumers are willing to pay more and if governments impose a carbon price, I think it will really change change the game in a big way, a serious carbon price. Ajay, just to keep on the theme of government regulations, you touched on monocropping and the dangers of monocropping. There are, in fact, government subsidies, incentives that um, that push farmers towards monocropping. Are there simple things that can be done to, to, to change that? I'll take out the word simple. Are there things that governments need to do um, to change that? So if you look at developing countries, the developing countries are forced to give subsidies to their farmers because of subsidies that are given in the West, which artificially drive down farm gate prices to a level where developing farmers can't realistically compete with them. And that's where the problem begins. The problem does not begin in India. It begins of how the West, which has money, is performing. And the second problem, why farmers require subsidies or support is because industry, which is big businesses, which are aggregating from farmers, are not giving them a fair price and the the farmers are not getting a fair share of the consumer price. You look at milk prices, so so you, you have a food value chain, a very efficient food value chain in the US. It's very disaggregated in India, but in India, 
a, a, a milk farmer a, a, where the cow gets a higher share in the consumer price than he gets in the U.S. You look at cocoa farmers. So, so the question hmm. is that it's not so simple to say that what can the government do? The governments are trying to do what they can, but they have financial limitations. But I want to just come back on this point of regulation. Just, yeah. just, just let this, very this quickly, Ajay. Yeah. Very quickly. Now, my only submission as a farmer from a developing country is that companies, multinational companies, which are centered in Europe and North America and all the other rich places, they have different regulation in their home countries. They come to developing countries where regulation and governance is not good. They should have the ethics of following the same rules and regulations they have in their own countries for packaging. If they come to India, the rules don't exist. Doesn't mean you mm. start packaging differently. You got to have the ethics of doing and following the same conditions that you have in your home countries. I mean, they, you cannot have yeah. that distinction between good terrorists and bad terrorists. It's the same argument. I want to bring all of you back um, once our second panel is wrapping up. So I hope that um, you will you will be able to intervene at the end of this. But I want to thank you all for bringing um, your perspectives and for uh, getting us to think a little bit deeper about about this. Thank you very so, much. Thanks very much. Thank you. And now, if I may. Um, bring up for uh, for the audience our second panel. Um, and they too are joining from uh, many uh, time zones. So we have um, Clover Hogan, a 21-year-old climate activist. Uh, Clover, I declined to ask you earlier where you're joining from. Are you in England? Yes, I'm in London, in Waterloo. Okay, in joining from Waterloo, Clover Hogan, and the founder of an organization called Force of Nature. From Chicago, uh, Earthrin Cousin, um, a visiting scholar at the Center for Food Security and the Environment, um, and the former um, head of the um, World Food Program. Yes. Yes, that's how uh, we met. Um, that is yeah, how we met. several years ago. And finally, from uh, Redwood City, California, Pat Brown, the uh, CEO and founder of Impossible Foods. So, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for this. Another very quick lightning round. Please indulge me. First, a true, true, true or false? The largest land-based carbon sink are peatlands. True. <laughs> that is true. Pat, you agree? Uh, I think forest. The largest land-based carbon sinks may indeed be peatlands. Yeah. Many of them are damaged. Yeah. How much of the soybeans produced in the world goes directly into the foods we eat? 6%, 16%, or 66%? Six. Six. <laughs> Six, most of it goes for animal feed. Most of it goes for animal feeds, indeed. True or false, climate change is affecting already the world's coffee production. True. True. Yeah. It is indeed true and uh, affecting quite profoundly uh, coffee producers who are by and large smallholder uh, farmers. So, um, I want to start with uh, with you, Pat Brown. Uh, I am uh, uh, constantly trying to fool my uh, my child with what is uh, animal meat and non-animal meat. I don't even have a a, a word for it. Um, there is a race for all kinds of new protein, right? New meats, lab-grown meats, plant-based 
meats uh, and so forth. And prices, I gather, are dropping for all of these new forms of, of meat. So if I understand the labels of many of the plant-based meats that I'm seeing at the, at the supermarket, it's mainly proteins derived from legumes, soy and pea protein and so forth. Is that right, Pat? Um, I, well, I can't talk about products across the board. I think that that's correct um, uh, for the meat that we make in Impossible Foods. The major protein source is uh, from soy. Yeah, soy is, by the way, a uh, super high quality protein. Um, it actually has a, a better protein quality score than beef. Um, it's in terms of amino acid balance and digestibility. And another interesting statistic, since you brought up soybeans, is that actually this year's global soybean crop, which is grown on just 0.8% of Earth's land area, contains 150% as much human usable protein as all the meat consumed globally. Okay, which I think is just. Wait, say that again, please. This the this year's soybean crop. Yes which is grown on 0.8% of Earth's land area, as opposed mm -hmm. to more than 40% for animal agriculture alone, um, contains 50% more human usable protein than all the meat consumed globally, okay? And, but your statistic is exactly, <laughs> illustrates the problem. The reason we don't benefit from that is because we turn the vast majority of it into pigs and chickens and cows before we consume it. It's by far the biggest food waste problem in the world. Where do you see the future of meats going? And, and how soon is that, is that future? Well, um, Impossible Foods was founded, um, you know, it's, it's called a food company. It actually was founded as a sort of planetary health technology company um, with the mission of uh, completely replacing the use of animals as a food production technology globally by 2035. And as far as I'm concerned, we are exactly on that trajectory. It's going to happen for sure. Um, we know it's doable. We know from a technical perspective, we can make foods that to meat-loving consumers are actually, once they try it, preferred over the animal product. And we're just getting started. We're getting better and better at this every single day. And the environmental footprint is a tiny fraction of the environmental footprint of the incumbent system. Our greenhouse gas footprint is one ninth of the, the footprint of the animal product, and our water footprint is one eighth, and our fertilizer footprint is one twelfth, and the land footprint is one twenty fifth. And that's the most important thing. Um, so um, this is absolutely essential. Um, for the future of global biodiversity and, and a healthy climate. And it's completely doable. And it's not going to be by force. It's not going to be by argument. It's going to be by doing a better job of serving consumers mm -hmm. and giving them what they value, which is deliciousness, nutritional value, and affordability. And it's going to mm -hmm. happen. Arthur, can I ask you a question that... Um, uh, I think a lot of us are asked all the time, which is how much of a difference can an individual make, even when it comes to the emissions from our food system? Really, how much of this is about individual behavior change and how much of this is about other stuff about regulations on the food sector, on um, where investors are putting their money. So you want to take a stab at that? Well, the reality is consumers, individuals, control all the power. Because if we don't buy, then farmers don't plant, investors won't invest, the systems don't work. If consumers are not willing to support with their dollars the, the, the product changes that will uh, create the environmental impact changes that we require. 
And all of that, though, is directly, uh, they're, they're, it's all inter, inter mm -hmm. bingo because if you don't have the policies that support the types of subsidies and, that are necessary for farmers to make the behavior change that is required, you cannot provide products that are at a price point that consumers can afford. Um, the, the challenge is making the change in what is available affordable for everyone so that we don't create even more disparity in our food system by who has access to the most nutritious food, to the food that has the best uh, or the least impact yeah. on our planet. Um, and, and that's what is not happening today. Um, and and, and uh, I appreciate to if I can go back to our uh, Pat and the Impossible Burger, I, I love Impossible Burgers, uh, but I think about the community of interest that I serve can't afford Impossible Burgers. How do we ensure that we are creating new tools that have, that everyone can have access to? Well, that's a, let me respond to that because I think Please. you've made an excellent point. Um, because the way that we make our product is so much more efficient, one twenty-fifth the land, you know, one eighth the water, one twelfth the fertilizer, um, even further reduction in, in pesticide use, um, and a twenty-fifth the land. Those and less labor. The costs, all the costs that make food expensive, if you make it directly from plants, um, are vastly reduced compared to, to making those foods from animals. So. At scale, plant-based meat, the way that we're producing it, is going to be vastly less expensive than producing it this insanely inefficient and wasteful way we do, with, with the most destructive technology on Earth using animals. But the different, the reason our product is, you know, we're lowering our prices all the time. I mean, you know, every single year we're making big reductions because we're passing on as we get the economies of scale and the efficiencies, we're passing on the fundamental structural economic advantages of making food directly from plants with all, without all the expensive resource use and all the expense of all the intermediate steps of using animals. And uh, one of our biggest driving motivations is to make food more affordable, to reduce hunger and nutrient deficiencies globally, which are, of course means in the poor parts of the world where it's an affordability issue. So this is going to vastly improve that problem. Arthur and Cousin, can I go back to um, what you raised? You said we're not there yet. What are the uh, concrete, two or three concrete public policy instruments that will, um, that will get us there from your vantage point? We need subsidies that support the for ability- what? For what? We need subsidies that support the ability for farmers to invest in more regenerative agricultural practices. We can't ex ask farmers to make change if we are not supporting their ability financially to make those changes. We need to, subsidies that support the, 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 har the cultivation and harvesting of more uh, diverse crops, not just uh, the crops that are subsidized today. We, we still in the United States think of produce as a specialty crop and limit the amount of resources that we provide to farmers that produce uh, that produce produce as compared to those that produce more the corn and soy. And so that we also need to ensure that we are providing access to land for younger farmers who are interested in producing more diverse more diverse uh, crops. And the, so providing the financial support for land acquisition that will ensure that farmers who today are renting because they can't afford farmland and as a result can't afford the practices that would allow them to invest in more regenerative, uh, more, uh, more regenerative agriculture, or planting more diverse crops. Uh, we need to overcome that by providing those farmers with subsidies that will support and their, their capacity to purchase land. So 
So that's three. I can go on. I'll stop mm. here. But let me add one more, which yep. I think is, is really critical. We need to increase the amount of money for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Right now, if I am receiving SNAP benefits, which is how the poorest in our country pay for food, I get about, a, a, the, the benefit is about $1.35 per person per meal. There's not a lot of healthy food that you can buy with $1.35. We, the, we, there's been a, a much talk about increasing that by just 30% to, or 15% to add an additional 30 cents to that benefit. And uh, the Congress hasn't been able to pass it. And so as we think about um, changing consumer behavior and changing what is available, we also need to always ensure that we are providing the opportunity for everyone, even regardless of, of uh, income, to benefit from the changes that we have. I mean, this has long been a real um, dilemma in the food system. Some of the um, uh, least expensive foods also happen to be uh, the unhealthiest foods. And the cost of that to the public health, of course, uh, shows up in, in, other, in other ways. Yes, it does. Um, Clover Hogan, I want to um, ask you to respond to you know, the original question, how much can an individual do just by voting with my fork? How do I even know what I'm buying and what is the environmental impact of that when I go shopping? Yeah, so um, to take a step back for a second, um, I was quite concerned with some of what I heard in the last panel, um, because while a number of the panelists kept referring to broken systems, um, all of the proposed solutions were largely plasters um, over what is the gaping wound of a broken food system. And I think food is one of the best examples that we have of how we have divorced ourselves from nature, from where our food is grown, the resources that go into it, you know, who actually grows the food. And so as a consumer, living in a hyper-globalized, hyper-consumptive world, it's very difficult to know what has actually gone into that food and, and what it is that I'm eating. And I find it quite frustrating when we put too much onus on the individual or try to mm -hmm. equate an individual's moral contribution to climate change or ecological breakdown with the company whose leaders and their decisions equate many, many millions of individuals. And the same goes for policymakers and people who are actually creating these regulations. Now, as much as the climate crisis is the symptom of these broken systems, there are myriad solutions. And in fact, Project Drawdown is an excellent piece of research that offers them up on a silver platter. And a number of scientists from around the world have come to the conclusion that three of the best five solutions that we have to actually draw down carbon from the atmosphere is moving toward plant-based diets, um, reducing food waste, and protecting tropical forests, which are currently under greatest threat because of animal agriculture. And so this isn't a matter of continuing to plaster over the problems, but actually think about how we're disrupting these systems. And that's why I think Impossible Foods is so exciting as a system, is it saying, okay, actually, we're not going to change this by badgering consumers into becoming more vegetarian or kind of having to sacrifice the thing that we love. It's actually here is an alternative that delivers all the things that you really enjoy without actually having to give up any of the, the things that you really have grown to love through culture and, and all of that. So I think individual decisions can be very empowering from a values perspective so that you can feel good about yourself, you can feel good about your impact, but I would not want that conversation to detract from the very uh, considered effort from people in positions of power to sustain this very broken system and to pretend that incrementalism is going to deliver on the climate solutions when we're told by scientists that we have just 10 years to change so much of how we live, breathe and exist. Um, a question from the audience, and, and before I, I get there, I think, Clover Hogan, what you mean is that scientists have said this decade, the 20s, um, is absolutely crucial, that 
emissions, global greenhouse gas emissions need to be cut by 50% by 2030 if we have um, a reasonable chance of averting the worst catastrophe. Um, science doesn't quite um, uh, say exactly when that cliff is going to come, but in order to have a pretty good chance of averting uh, real climate catastrophes, our best shot is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in the next 10 years, which means um, really radical changes in the way we eat, um, what we drive, um, and where our electricity comes from. Um, the, the, can I, can I, yes, one, one second, Pat, because a, a really excellent question came in from the audience, actually two that are really for you. Um, using soy as the, as one of the main ingredients for Impossible Burger, um, are there some dangers associated with that, particularly, um, uh, the audience member asks uh, corporate soy production. Um, I'm wondering about monocropping. Does that encourage monocropping and bring some environmental hazards um, uh, there? And related, uh, another audience member says, I admire the mission of Impossible Foods, but it seems so highly processed. Do you want to say something about Wow, those? There's, there's a bunch of questions there. So first of all, um, the uh, from a nutrition and health standpoint, I mean, soy has been extensively studied for for decades, and it has been a major part of the food system in many parts of the world for far longer than that. I mean, you know, I think the, the samurais got probably more than half their proteins from soybeans back in the day, um, and they 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 did okay. Um, so it, there's no fundamental nutritional and health problem from soy protein at all. In fact, it's, it's by basically any reasonable measure better than uh, any animal protein. Um, but uh, there was another question about monocropping. I love that question. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I'll just say that you know we're working on other sources of protein for our products. Um, as as Clover may remember back in the day when she spent a little time at Impossible, we're working on uh, actually developing proteins from leaves as a major source of protein in the human diet. There are many reasons why that would be valuable, including a uh, vastly reduced requirement for focusing on any single crop because basically leaves, leaves are leaves. And um, so we're working on that in the long term, but right now, basically, if you need to depend on the existing supply chain, uh, soybeans are the best choice from a nutrition and health standpoint. And as I mentioned, they occupy um, a tiny fraction of the amount of land that animals, uh, animal agriculture uses. Let me touch about the monocropping thing. Wow, what a what a good call out. The the monocrop, the ultimate monoculture is cows. Okay the ultimate monoculture, the ultimate invasive species. Today, the total biomass of cows on Earth is more than 10 times the biomass of every remaining wild mammal, reptile, and amphibian put together, okay? We've essentially completely replaced nature with cows. So talk about monocropping. I mean, that, is, that give me a break. The cows are like a metastatic cancer that's growing out of control and is spread across the earth, displacing and sucking the light out of healthy ecosystems. And imagine if I told you that 90% of the diverse healthy cells in your body have been replaced by cancer cells. You know, you'd be saying, well, geez, that's kind of a problem. And, and or if, if, if you have less than a third uh, as many of those healthy cells as you had 50 years ago, which is the case for biodiversity, we have less than a third as many wild mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish living on Earth today as we had just 50 years ago, okay? And it's almost entirely due to the massive sprawl of animal agriculture. So um, I think that if, you, if you're concerned about monoculture, I totally agree with you. I'm as concerned as you are. Uh, let's deal with the cow monoculture problem. Um, then processed, that's a very good question. I think it's, it's a word that gets applied to a lot of foods. First of all, everything that, that you eat virtually has been processed. You don't, it doesn't just fall off a plant and, or an animal and land in your plate. 
And if you if you make if you prepare any food in your kitchen, you're you're cooking, you're cutting, you're you're blending, you're grinding, you're doing all sorts of processing because you know that when you do that with those raw materials, you make something that's better than the sum of the parts in terms of deliciousness and nutrition uh, and uh, and even environmental impact. So um, processing per se is not a bad thing. Um, but the term gets applied um, it, inappropriately to, for example, our products, which are made of carefully chosen healthy ingredients. A Twinkie is an unhealthy food, okay? I agree with you that when people talk about processed foods, they think of Twinkies because a lot of big food companies to pump up profits at the expense of consumer health fill their foods with, with empty calories, sugar, um, uh, you know, they, they removed all the healthy nutrients from a lot of the ingredients and they produced junk that, that uh, um, is, you know, unarguably bad for your health. In our case, we were incredibly deliberate about the choice of ingredients. You can read our nutritional panel. That's what I would encourage you to look at. Um, that's ultimately what matters. Um, do, so you're saying processed, yes, but there's good for you processed and there's bad for you processed is your contention. Absolutely. Everything, everything. I bet. Can I ask, can I ask the panelists, um, um, including you, Pat Brown, are you proposing that everyone stop eating red meat no. and that red meat consumption stop entirely or I mean, something else? Earthrun Cousin, you're shaking your head, so you go no. first. I can, I, I'll, I'll definitively say no. Um, I think it, what the, all of the data, the science tells us that we in the West eat far more uh, red meat um, than, than we should for our health and for the planet. But there are other, so a reduction in consumption of animal-based protein is definitely, a, 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 a should be uh, the, the, the desire of those of us living in the West. But there are other parts of the world where the consumption of animal-based protein should be increased, where we know that there is not enough access to protein of any kind and we have increased uh, stunt we see increases in stunting and uh, and malnutrition as a result of that lack of access to protein so it's not a one size fits all exactly. it is reducing the consumption of red meat in places like north america where there is entirely too much consumption of red meat um, uh, pat brown did you have something to add um, yeah, actually, I, I, I quite disagree with that um, statement. The problem with malnutrition isn't that there's not enough red meat, it's that there's not enough protein and iron in the diet. And um, what we're trying to do at Impossible Foods is not take, take, people, take burgers out of people's hands or take their choices of meat away from them. It's, it, it's, it's our job to make meat that does a better job of delivering what consumers value from meat, which is the particular kind of delicious sensory experience, uh, the nutritional value, the affordability, the convenience, and stuff like that. If we can do that, if we can make meat vastly more sustainably from plants that delivers everything that consumers value from meat, which we can, um, then it's not gonna be uh, taking anything away from consumers. It's replacing an incredibly destructive technology for making meat with a better technology for making uh, meat that that delivers all the same value. I there may be really another important. point. I, I really need to come in here because this is yes, really please. important. But by Pat's own admission, the products that they are making today are not affordable for everyone. I'm a pragmatist. I work with the poorest people in the world, and I, uh, the responsibility that we have is to ensure that as advocates, we are providing solutions that will address the challenges that people are facing today. As we move forward and we have more animal-based proteins that can substitute for an egg or other, uh, uh, we have more plant-based proteins that can substitute for animal-based proteins, then let's have this, this this dialogue about how we change diets around the world. But for today, it's context-based. It should be context-based on um, what the population requires to ensure access to the nutritious food that is necessary to meet the dietary requirements of people everywhere. 
Arthur and Cousin, I think you and I have both been to places where meat production is also a matter of livelihoods. Yes. Where people depend on animals to make a living and where um, meat is also a cultural um, item. Um, so I'm curious what uh, what happens to, you know, Thanksgiving or Sunday or Sunday roast. Um, Clover Hogan, did you want to um, add something on the question of, of meat or broadly speaking on um, what are some of the things, if not um, as individuals, what are some of the things that you would like to see people think about um, and, and advocate for? Sure. Um so I, I find it really interesting, the comparison between working with young people, so 11 through 16 year olds um, versus working with business leaders, um, because there's quite a distinction in mindset. So I think one of the benefits of younger minds is that perhaps we haven't been around long enough to take some of these systems for granted and just to accept that they are as they are. Um, and I think a threat like climate change invites us to rethink so much of what we kind of take to be gospel in the world today. And that's why when we kind of fall back on assumptions that, you know, people need red meat to, to prosper and that we need red meat for protein. Um, in fact, so many of those stories are just that. They're kind of cultural fictions that we've subscribed to. And, and I would argue, Samidi, that you know, we don't necessarily need to give up the things that we love. We don't need to give up the Thanksgivings or the Christmas roasts. Um, you know, technologies and solutions like the Impossible Burger show that we can continue to have the things that we really love and that are important to us um, without actually having to feel terrible about it because there is this huge unintended consequence on our health, on the environment and on the planet. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to kind of break out of that bubble a little bit and actually think, okay, how can we rethink this? And I grew up in Indonesia, I grew up in Bali. And so, you know, a lot of the environmental and social challenges were right front and center um, from plastic pollution through the rise mm -hmm. of diabetes um, of a changing diet. And it was very interesting to see how local communities and their health began to change as they adopted more quote unquote Western mm -hmm. diets. Mm -hmm. And communities went from being actually really healthy and having localized food supply chains to eating highly processed food, eating much more meat. And ironically, the McDonald's Big Mac in Bali was actually marketed as the prosperity burger. So suddenly uh -huh. being able to eat red meat was a sign of wealth. So that was a new cultural narrative that was being imposed. And probably meat made, made far away, meals made far away. We exactly. are right up at the end of our time <laughs> for our panel. Um, meat is always a, 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 a lively, uh, subject. I want to bring back um, the panelists from the previous session. Um, are you all together now? I can't quite see you all on my screen. Yes, now I can. Yeah. Yes, we're back. Um, we have very little time. And I just want to ask for anyone on the panel to, to react to this. We obviously have a very important election coming up. Um, the uh, and I and I wonder if there are any of these um, issues that we have talked about that are front and center in your mind as the elections approach. Do you think that the uh, or rather, what is at stake for you, whether you are a voter in the United States or whether you are a person living somewhere else in the world? What is at at stake for you as Americans go to the polls and climate change becomes an increasingly important issue on the minds of voters. Does anyone want to take that? Rebecca. I think the question of whether climate change is real is at stake in this election. So if you think climate change is a real thing, and if you think that the United States taking active action to engage with this reality is important, this election is incredibly important. 
Uh, the US, alas, has disproportionate effects throughout the rest of the world. And to have an America that's committed to moving forward against climate change would make an enormous <clears throat> difference. Ajay, you put up your hand. Yes. I think it makes no difference who's president of the United States for the developing world. They are going to listen to big ag. They're going to listen to big industry. It's all diplomatic hearsay in the election. There's going to be no change in U.S. policy. There's going to be no change in how they give subsidies to farmers. There's no change in how they're going to drive, where they can drive developing countries down a pipeline they don't want to go in. And that's mm -hmm. a fact. Makes no difference. Eric, for your operations, do the results but, of this I mean, election... I, I, cannot, I cannot comment uh, on, on the Zenon side. I can just give you my, my personal opinion. Uh, I believe in democracy. I think uh, we need American people. They will decide. Yeah. And, and, and I think American people uh, uh, will decide by voting to, on the 3rd of November, and they've started voting. And they're also deciding every day when they choose the brand they are purchasing. So they are also voting for the world they want to live in. And, and I think this is also a very strong uh, capacity that, uh, that uh, every citizen has. And, uh, and we, need, we, need, we need America, the world, uh, the, this is the, the, the largest power right now in the world, and that's the fact. So, so of course, this vote is important, uh, but, but I think every day, everyone make a choice uh, in its consumption pattern, in, mm -hmm. in the way he wants to drive li his life, and that's also very important. And it's a way to vote as well. So that's what I want to say. Pat Brown, Clover Hogan, Earthrun Cousin, any of you want to jump in? Oh, yeah, I'll jump in. Say, yeah, so um, obviously... No, Earthrun, Earth please, go right ahead. No, I was, I'm sorry, Pat. I was just going to say that um, I'm not going to make a political speech. I ask you to look at... I, I ask every American to vote. The challenge, and look at the platforms and the actions of each of the candidates and vote for the candidate that is going to support the climate, the 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 to support the climate action that is necessary for us to achieve the planetary health. Uh, vote for the candidate that is going to provide the, the agricultural support for subsidies, for research, for, for investment that is necessary to change our agricultural system in a way that will make it not just efficient and effective, but agile and sustainable and resilient. And that I think then every citizen in the United States can't stop at voting. You need to continuously ensure that elected officials know that these issues matter to the people of this country. Pat Brown. Um, well, I think there's a tremendous amount of, at stake in the, in the election. I, I don't want to comment too much about it because I'll just go on forever. <laughs> but the one thing I'll say is um, uh, when I founded Impossible Foods, one of the premises was governments aren't going to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter who's in power. Governments aren't are, don't have the willpower, don't have the capability of solving this problem. International organizations don't aren't going to solve this problem. The Paris Climate Agreement signed on to a 1.5 degree Celsius increase in global average temperature. That is absolutely ridiculous. It has to be solved um, by individual initiative. Um, the the Impossible Foods approach is basically whatever governments do, they can't stop consumer-driven decisions. So if we can, can solve this environmental problem by making products that consumers prefer, no one can stop that. And it's the only way of ensuring success, um, irrespective of how elections go and how messed up the world politics are. Which that are is a, um, a vast spectrum of opinion you've heard from what individuals do matter the most um, to um, uh, who wins the US election will have absolutely no impact on, on what decisions are made. Um, I want to invite Gonzalo Munoz back up, please, uh, and invite you to make a closing remark. Are you there, Gonzalo? Yes, I'm here. And okay. first, so many thank you for the the, the conversation that we just uh, listened to. I think this will, this is definitely a dream team. It's a privilege to learn from this brilliant group of committed people from all around the world, literally delivering very concrete action. So thanks so much for that. If I can try to resume part of what I've heard, of course, I think that I should start with the phrase that Eric brought of 
this food system that is broken, that should not only move from linear to circular, but also to regenerative. I think that also Ajay brought a great concept of these farmers, food producers that are starving. That's an element that should be definitely urgently corrected uh, while also understanding how much of uh, the value of using the right practices should be something that the world should pay for. Markets and, and, and policymakers should, should take that into consideration in order to pay, put the price and the value of that type of practice. Uh, all of the aspects around monoculture, I, I love that discussion, whether it's about cows or soy or, or any other type of monoculture. I'm a farmer myself, so uh, consider me in onto that discussion. Uh, of course, the element uh, that Rebecca brought of consumers that can and must be part of the solution is absolutely critical. And that also takes me to the ideas that Pat brought in terms of the possibilities of dramatically changing the way we understand food in no longer than the next 15 years. So how much of the, the possibilities we have in hand in terms of solve that, considering the nutrition needs, but not only the nutrition needs, but also how do we connect that to what Etherin and Eric uh, mentioned on the individual holding the power with their dollars, also considering what Etherin uh, mentioned about what is available at that amount of what people can really afford. So we have to solve so many distortions that we do have on a daily basis. Differentiating as well, and I love that also that Etherin brought on the difference between developing countries and developed countries, that you cannot implement one single solution for the whole world. And, uh, and I think that Clover also brought all the expression of how much we are divorced uh, from, from nature and how much of that is absolutely different when you are considering uh, the younger people that, as she mentioned, are capable of changing all the assumption as cultural fictions that should be somehow confronted through health, through climate crisis, and also with the technological possibilities that we already have. I think that I will take that, that last word of Clover saying, the people in position of power should be able to help fix this broken system as soon as possible. And that means no longer than 2050. We know that this panel showed that it's possible uh, no longer than 2035. So thank you very much for what you have given us. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. I, it is my turn now to hand the mic over to Whitney Richardson. And before I do that, thank you all for joining from your very different time zones. Um, and thank you to the audience for, for joining us. We'll see you at the next one. Whitney. Hi, and thank you so many for that skillful moderation and your summary. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers and to our audience members for their participation and your questions. They came in and we were so grateful for them. We also want to thank our sponsor, Indigo Ag, for supporting today's session. We look forward to welcoming each of you to our next digital event in the Netting Zero series focused on financial systems and transforming them on December 1st. You can find more information and register for that event and others in the series on nytclimatehub.com, where a recording of today's event will also be viewable in the coming days. You can also find more digital events from the New York Times on timesevents.nytimes.com, including another session on the future of food and the state of the restaurant business scheduled for next Tuesday. Thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>